China's President Xi Jinping is scheduled to visit the United States later this month. His attendance at a nuclear security summit will be his second trip to Washington in less than a year, as the relationship between China and the United States continues to evolve. The two superpowers have mutual security concerns, such as the nuclear issue with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the threat of international terrorism from groups like ISIL. But there are also significant differences, including their policy views about the South China Sea. Later, I will talk to two Chinese journalists about these issues, but we begin with former United States Secretary of Defense William Cohen, who joined me earlier. Mr. Secretary, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. When we look at the relationship between the United States and China, you were Secretary of Defense from 1997 to 2001. You left office 15 years ago. When you look at the last 15 years, how do you see that relationship evolving? Well, I think uh, on the one hand, it's gotten better. Uh, one of the first things I did uh, was to introduce the notion of having a hotline between the Defense Department and uh, the Chinese counterpart. Uh, that took 10 years. And so between 1997 and 2007, there obviously was a lot of uh, discussion taking place and the building of a better relationship from a military to military point of view. Um, since that time, I think it, the military relationship is still good and getting better, slowly but surely. But there is still a fundamental strategic uh, mistrust that exists between the Chinese military and the US military. And um, we have to work very hard to try and break that down as best we can, understanding there are bound to be disagreements, different interpretations of rule of law and how it applies uh, to China and to the U.S. Uh, as China continues to build uh, its military consistent with uh, the country that it is. Uh, I may have mentioned uh, some time ago that I was there when uh, Deng Xiaoping announced his four modernizations, the military being the last one. And I think we're seeing that last one now uh, starting to unfold in a way that is um, quite um, astonishing and intimidating in some respects, but inevitable. When you talk about the mistrust between the two militaries, uh, how does one resolve that? How do you fix that? Well, you try and engage each other on a much more frequent basis. Uh, you try to be as transparent as possible. Uh, certainly, we have a great deal of transparency uh, in our budgetary process uh, in the United States. We have to announce in advance what our uh, goals are, what our equipment is, what we're trying to design, how we're to be deployed. And I think China, as it continues to um, evolve into a major regional power, and perhaps beyond that, uh, has to become more transparent in terms of its capabilities, but also its intentions. Intentions can change, and therefore capabilities become very crucial in terms of trying to assess what the downside of, of, of poor intentions or bad intentions might be, just as the Chinese have to look at the United States and say, well, it sounds all well and good that you're simply reinforcing your relationships, but um, in a negative way that could be used against us. So let's put all of the cards on the table if we can and see if we can't uh, have more um, military to military relations, both in peacetime, uh, peacekeeping missions, and also training exercises. I have been a strong advocate to bring China's military into some of the exercises that we do with our allies in the region. So. Uh, China doesn't see this as some sort of overt uh, plan to encircle it, uh, to uh, build a, a type of relationship that would be adverse to China's interests. So I think the more we can train with each other and understand each other and appreciate each other's respective capabilities and roles, is a better chance of avoiding miscalculation uh, or even a, a potential conflict. Right. When we look at areas of cooperation, let's look at some specifics. President Xi Jinping will be here in the United States at the end of this month in Washington for the Nuclear Security Summit. It will be his second visit in less than a year. What are your expectations of the summit and China's role in it? I think it's very important, number one, that he's coming. I think it's always good when you have the leader of China meeting with the leader of the United States. So just the meeting itself is very important. In terms of substance, I think obviously the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction continues to be on the agenda, I would think, of both countries. North Korea has been uh, rattling its saber recently. 
It has uh, alleged that it has developed a capability of miniaturizing warheads so it could fire an ICBM on um, an um, uh, intercontinental uh, basis. That should be of concern to China. It's certainly of concern to us. So uh, seeing what is taking place in terms of the spread of this technology, what does that mean uh, to China's security, to our security? Terrorism is certainly on the uh, agenda. Uh, terrorists acquiring either weapons of mass destruction or a dirty bomb or something that could create horrific damage will be on the agenda. Um, cyber terrorism, something that both countries are concerned about. Um, there have been allegations about Chinese uh, cyber attacks in the United States. China is saying, well, the United States is not exactly innocent in this regard. And so there needs to be kind of a rules of the road understanding of some attacks are going to continue. Some of them are not state-sponsored, that they're uh, either road warriors or um, hackers or others. And we have to make sure that we understand um, what is taking place so that one side doesn't respond in a way that's inconsistent uh, with the other's interests um, and, and um, intentions. So there's a lot that can be discuss discussed, food security, um, air uh, quality security. There are a host of issues of uh, concern to all of us. I want to get back to one of the things you mentioned, and that is the DPRK's missile and nuclear program. That has been a source of tension uh, in that part of the world. Let's listen to what the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi had to say on this issue a short while ago. If the country seeks development and security, we're prepared to help and provide support. But at the same time, we have an unwavering commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And we will not accommodate the DPRK's pursuit of nuclear and missile programs. So China has made its position very clear. It wants dialogue. It wants cooperation. Uh, how does China find a diplomatic solution to this? Uh, in some way, could we see a resumption of the six-party talks? I think that will be difficult given what um, uh, Kim Jong-un is doing. Uh, I think there have been efforts underway by the South Korean president to establish more cooperation. I know that China is very concerned about uh, Kim Jong-un's um, saber rattling, firing of missiles, uh, threatening uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, launch missiles against the United States. So I think China is in a better position than anyone. Uh, to try and get the attention of uh, the North Korean leader because he's pursuing a policy of guns and butter. Uh, the guns he's developing, the butter he's getting from China and a few other countries perhaps. And so China doesn't want to be in a position to totally undermine his uh, regime or call for regime change. At the same time, they're concerned about uh, a belligerent attitude on his part that could jeopardize security in the region. So I think they're signing on to a, um, a UN security uh, resolution that calls for more sanctions uh, is important. And I think the discussions as to whether South Korea will agree to put a THAAD system, a terminal high altitude defense capability on uh, South Korean soil uh, will be seen as China as being too provocative or in any way interfering with China's own military capabilities. It shouldn't, but nonetheless, that kind of a political discussion has to take place between the United States and South Korea and China. But and, when we look at that and, system that you're talking about, and sanctions for that matter, um, are those things going to deter North Korea? We don't know. Nothing seems to have worked to date. Uh, we've tried uh, the, um, the olive branch. It doesn't seem to work. Um, we have tried sanctions. They have had an impact but not have been, they have not been dispositive. And so it may be a combination of the two that uh, uh, China says very clearly, we're not going to continue to support you uh, in terms of the lifestyle to which you and your leadership have become accustomed to. This means more hardship for you uh, and not necessarily your people. Uh, and in the event you continue to do what you're doing, you're going to face a South Korea that's going to uh, put in place a system that uh, we find uh, objectionable but may be inevitable. Another point of contention between the United States and China, and that is China's role, activities in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. How does the United States address Chinese concerns that Washington is trying to contain China in that part of the world? Well, the United States has to be as persuasive as we can to say 
What we want is no one country to dominate the region. Not the United States, not China, not anyone else. And so our goal has been to keep the area as peaceful as possible and have any disputes uh, resolved uh, through arbitration or direct negotiation. And, um, and that's been our goal. Now, in the meantime, we've said China is growing militarily. It's starting to flex its muscle in the region. What we need to do, what we're trying to do, is saying, look, we understand that growth, and it's inevitable, but we want you to make sure that you use it in a way that's fully integrated into the international rule of law. And so we have allies in the region. Uh, we have a small uh, group of Marines in, um, in Australia, quite a ways away from China. We're not putting ships and positioning them in Singapore, but rotating a few littoral combat ships through. And so we're trying to conduct our way, ourselves in a way that doesn't threaten China and doesn't seek to encompass it and encircle it and persuade China that is not our mission and goal. And that's why more talks, more transparency, inviting China to participate in more of these exercises, I think will go a long way to dispelling the notion that this is all an effort to really contain China. I do not believe China can be contained. It will not be contained. Right, but that conduct that you speak about, when we look at U.S. naval actions in the South China Sea, they're seen as provocations by China. I mean, is that a valid concern on the part of the Chinese? No. What have they done to, in fact, um, demonstrate provocation? Um, there is the issue with Taiwan. And that perhaps has been the most dispositive thing in the past. Uh, the 1978 uh, legislation passed by the United States Congress that the U.S. has an obligation to provide defensive equipment for Taiwan. Right. But absent that, uh, I don't know what we're doing uh, in a way that poses an aggressive um, action towards China. Yeah, the dispute is over territorial integrity, issues of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. The Chinese feel that the sovereignty has been violated. Well, the question of sovereignty uh, depends on if China declares all of the South China Sea to be China's sovereign area, then there is a problem, uh, because that would have to be recognized by the international community. Uh, I don't think that that's going to happen, but uh, that's something that needs to be discussed. Uh, if we look at uh, the world right now, as you pointed out at the outset of this interview, it's a dangerous world right now. There's issues of terrorism, nuclear proliferation. Uh, I want you to take a listen to what the foreign minister said about these particular issues. Let's watch. We want to deepen cooperation with other countries, including law enforcement and security cooperation. At the same time, we will play a constructive role in the political settlement of international and regional issues, so as to create a more secure and a stable environment for China's development overseas. So do you expect to see closer cooperation between the United States and China in dealing with some of these threats? I think there has to be. Um, I've always taken the position nothing good can come from a, uh, a, um, a rupture in relation, relation between the U.S. and China. Good things can happen if we cooperate on those issues on which we can uh, say that we share a common interest. Again, bound to be differences on given issues as we have them with our allies. But on the major issues that confront both of our countries, that we certainly should proceed. Um, I want to get to the United States election, uh, election campaign in full <laughs> okay. swing right now. Yes, <laughs> we are smiling about it. It's got very, uh, well, it's taken a downhill turn at points. Uh, we're hearing a lot of negative rhetoric about China during the current U.S. presidential right. campaign, uh, concerns about the trade relationship between the two countries. And I'm wondering, how concerned are you that relations could take a negative turn if this continues? Yeah. Well, I, I've said on many occasions that I've been quite impressed uh, with China's maturity, namely in the sense of looking at the U.S., uh, and seeing what is said during uh, campaigns and what results after a campaign. So 10 years ago, there might have been a very different reaction to this. Um, and uh, I've been disappointed, frankly, in the quality of the debate taking place. I think we have seen a degradation of the level of uh, dialogue. Uh, I think we have seen a degradation of civility and uh, discourse. And that's troubling to me. And I think that uh, the kind of statements that are made, uh, very provocative, uh, and uh, should cease and desist. Hopefully we'll get through this without a provocative reaction 
uh, coming from China looking at what we're saying and believing that's going to be true. I think we'll see a different reaction after the election than we're seeing before. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure.